Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, let me take the opportunity to congratulate Kenyans and, and Kenya for um, for their patience and their tolerance. Uh, five days of waiting is not is not easy in an African election, um, but they survive it, and I think that a prosperous and stable Kenya is is good for all of us. And uh, and I think Kenyans have to be congratulated. Let me just put my presentation context. So in 2012 elections, um, that was our sixth consecutive elections and largely successful election. The um, incumbent, John uh, Mahama, who five months earlier was the vice president um, of the NDC um, and then had to be promoted to president <coughs> because our president, John Atta Mills, died. And within five months, um, he was able to campaign and, and was retained with 50.7% uh, of the votes. The main challenger, Ekufu was, um, who was the defeated candidate in 2008, uh, received 47.7% of the vote. But once the results were announced, just like uh, in Kenya, uh, the MPP indicated they were going to challenge the results and follow suit uh, in December to file, it, to file a suit at the Supreme Court to challenge the results, alleging that there was a conspiracy between the Electoral Commission and the incumbent party to basically steal the elections for um, the, the incumbent. So actually, currently, the, the substantive case uh, will start very soon. Unfortunately, because I'm still a member of the Ghana Bar Association, I cannot say any f anything further than I have said regarding <coughs> the matter before the court. The other interesting thing was that, again, there were low levels of violence. Um, um, the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers, uh, which my institution have coordinated since uh, 2000, basically um, recorded 137 incidents of incidents, and out of that, only eight incidents were related to violence. So. Um, that has been quite interesting, you know, uh, for us in the sense that if you look at what happened in Kenya 2007 and, and what has happened in Ghana uh, uh, from mostly 1996, we've not had these kinds of uh, implosion. So, you know, what explains that? You know, why has Ghana escaped that violence? In spite of the similar conditions, and I'll go quickly through those similar conditions uh, so that we can we can move on. So you have a liberal democracy, you have <coughs> elite and mass support for democracy. If you have come across the Afrobarometer uh, opinion surveys, it shows a massive support uh, for democracy. If you look at Ghana in particular, from 52% in 2002 to 82% uh, in the last uh, round of Afrobarometer, which was the fifth round. Uh, Kenya has stayed up above like you know 70% over the period. Competitive elections, again, if you take Ghana, um, we the margin between the, the winning candidate and the losing candidate has reduced from 28% in 1992 to 0 046 percent uh, in 2008. Um, and in the just recent elections, it's also a very small margin. Vibrant civil society and media in both countries. You have a growing economy. Uh, Ghana, since 2003, has been growing at 5.8%. Uh, Kenya, I think, is about 4.8%. Then you have the bad, the bad uh, conditions as well. There's clientelism, there's uh, personal rule, there's big man rule, there's big woman rule, there's uh, imperial presidencies. You have a winner-takes-all system. And this is in spite of the fact that Ghana has a first-past-the-post system, uh, <coughs> Kenya has a sort of a proportional representation system, now it's going to have some sort of federal <coughs> system as well. Ethnic, ethnic mobilization in politics is still very, uh, uh, I think it's salient in both countries. I will talk more about that. Countervailing institutions are still weak, and political parties are really election machines. So uh, the conditions are similar, both good and bad. So you know, what, why has Ghana been successful? <coughs> the first three points I have there really has to do with the Electoral Commission, the Electoral Management Body, uh, uh, the Electoral Commission of Ghana, and its leadership. So from 1992, the, the development, uh, the 1992 election was basically a botch election. The opposition boycotted the parliamentary elections and boycotted parliament. 
after that, there was some sort of elite consensus that, you know, electoral politics was going to be the most important thing. Uh, we should sort of work with it. And then uh, reform started taking place. So we moved from wooden boxes to transparent uh, plastic boxes. I mean, that was important. The wooden boxes will pick people, assume people were stuffing the boxes. It was a big, uh, important decision. The other rule was that after the close of polls at 5 p.m., we counted the, the, the results right there. As that was another uh, <coughs> major development. Um, you know, we had, um, um, you know, other rules changing around that time. Photo IDs for urban areas. It used to be thumb printing. Um, th these were very important sort of movements on, on to improve electoral democracy. Then we can also talk about uh, informal institutions. The political parties with the Electoral Commission decided to set up what they call the Interparty Advisory Committee, which was basically a platform for the political parties to meet and discuss electoral disputes in the run-up to elections. So they could resolve it before, before elections. And this particular informal institution has become so popular that it's been replicated all around the Can place. Can you flip the slide, slides? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I've, I've talked about the 1992 constitution, the reforms of, uh, from 94, the informal institutions there, and the inter-party inter advisory committee, and as I said, that has been replicated all over the place. The competency of the EC, the EC has become more professional, it's organized elections very well <coughs> uh, in the past. There are deficits, uh, you know, still big deficits, particularly with respect to the um, the recruitment of temporary officers and their neutrality during election. That is an issue that keeps coming up uh, and uh, the EC are yet to deal with it. But generally it has been competent. Then the Dr. Farijan factor, the leader of the EC, the constitution guarantees a security of tenure for the chair of the, of the EC and his two deputies. And the, the, is, the, is the highest levels of, of security of tenure you can find in the Ghanaian constitution because is akin to the judicial security of tenure. So the electoral commissioner is at the level of a court of appeal judge, the uh, deputies at the court of a high court judge, and they are there permanently. So, I mean, he as a political scientist um, and, and his assertiveness over the period, having overseen two alternations in power, that has sort of cemented his credibility. Even though now the opposition basically are vilifying him and uh, next, next year he retires, he's facing uh, sort of a huge issue to, to protect his own legacy. Um, so we'll see how that happens and then what happens after he leaves. Now, the character of ethnic mobilization, and which is uh, an issue that I think uh, Kenya, uh, you, know, uh, you know, people talk about uh, ethnic politics as being critical in Kenya. And the reason why it hasn't really uh, become a problem in, in Ghana is because the way ethnic mobilization occurs in Ghana is a little different. And I'll show you, um, if, if you can show me the map, I'll be grateful. But whilst he's doing that, uh, let me just talk about it. So basically, what you have, um, if you, almost everybody who studied Ghana will tell you that, okay, everybody who studied Ghana will tell you that <coughs> Uh, ethni uh, ethnicity is salient in politics, but it's not a winning strategy. If you, you mobilize and you cite, uh, you will not win elections. You still have to perform uh, as a government. You have to do public goods. You have to do, uh, you know, manage the economy and so on. So it generates different incentives. The other thing is that it's also mediated through a set, a set of long, long years of a political settlement that says that Ghana is unitary a unitary state, it's a cohesive state, we all want to put it together. And even in the constitution, there's a general promotion of, uh, of ethnic balance. So if you are a, a, a government that does not appoint at least one member of, of the 10 regions of Ghana into your cabinet, it becomes an issue. And people take, take, take offense to that. So even in, in, in 1970, for instance, when the Progress Party could not appoint uh, uh, a minister and their parliamentary system from the voter region became a big problem because they didn't win any seats in, in the voter region. 
in 2005 when President Kufo could not appoint uh, a member uh, from the Upper West region into his cabinet, it became an issue. So Ghanaians are very sensitive you know, to the whole ethnic balance and elites know that that's important. What that does is that the strategy, if you are a party, is to present yourself as a unifier and not an ethnic chauvinist. If you do that, you lose elections. You know, and what I wanted to show you, uh, basically, how do we do this? <laughs> mm. Okay, good. If you, I'm sorry, it takes too long. Okay. This was, uh, aha. If you, you look, look at Ghana map, 208 elections, it looks like, it's two against seven regions. The MPP is the blue, the NDC is the green. That's the NDC's uh, won all those regions, and the MPP won those two. If you take um, a constituency map, you see it, it changes a little differently. You see that there's a lot more spread uh, in, in, the, in the way the parties are winning. But look at this map. This is the proportions This is the proportions that the parties won in all constituencies. It shows you why it is so competitive. Because even in places where the two parties dominate, and uh, uh, the MPP in Ashanti region and the, voter, uh, the NDC in voter region, even there, at least the parties still try to compete. And the margins have been reducing in those places. So it's, it's, you don't have that kind of polarization. You cannot win an election if you try to to push uh, with, with sort of ethnic mobilization. Uh, a related aspect is that there's a two-party political tradition that goes all the way back to the Independence Party, the Convention People's Party, and the United uh, 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 Gold Coast Convention, which basically have sort of evolved into different versions. So the NDC occupies the Nkumaish tradition, and then the MPP, the, the Dan Kwabuzia tradition. And they, that kind of access is Ha, is ad, attracts different social cleavages. So ethnic poli ethnicity is part of it, class is part of it, income is part of it. So you have to mobilize around that. Uh, you can go back to the. So for Ghana is different when it comes to uh, ethnic mobilization um, as compared to Kenya. Um, increasing professionalization of the intermediaries, the referees in elections, civil society, media, the election security tax, tax force. I'll just talk about election security tax force because you don't see it often in other countries. But the security agencies have, you know, nuanced the whole process of policing elections. So this election security tax force is set up, uh, which is chaired by the, uh, the Inspector General of Police. Uh, it includes the Army, the other security agencies, the Electoral Commission, and they try to strategize for, for how to police elections. And that kind of another kind of informal institution has become so important that it's becoming more and more institutionalized and they've taken some very important decisions. The other two things I want to talk about is support for support of donors. Uh, sorry if I can get the, the presentation back. Donors have been very important to Ghana elections and I think we cannot underestimate that. DFID, for instance, in the last election was the, the biggest supporter. Um, supported the Ghana Police Service, supported the Electoral Commission, uh, supported civil society, supported media. Um, and these kinds of support has made these referees more professional, but also more consistent. And so they, it has helped them to, to basically institutionalize the space they occupy uh, in Ghana elections. And um, uh, another aspect of that is these donor subgroups on, on, on uh, different thematic areas. And the one on election, the donor subgroups have emerged out of the multi-donor budget support process. But the one on election has since 2007 almost met every month. And that process of, of you know, that convening power to bring stakeholders together to think about elections over you know, all these years is for me one of the most important contributions that donors have made. <coughs> because you have the Electoral Commission there, you have the judiciary there, you have the police there, you have civil society there, and 
supporting each other and resolving issues as they plan because we elections are not an, an event anymore uh, in Ghana and stakeholders accept that and they try to work towards the next election last is ideas and <sighs> I think Gabriela did talk about when he was talking about the narrative of peace and just so sort of trying to situate in the, in the literature a little bit economists talk about you know that we are rational thinkers and we are you know pursuing our interests and so on and so forth but uh, we know that the difficulty with some of that is you know when we are trying to overcome our uh, our collective action problems we are trying to explain how we work together uh, sometimes it doesn't necessarily fit and i mean for me i think there's a power in in those who argue that discourses and and and, and, and you know these kinds of ideas can drive you know collective action uh, uh, among people, and I, I saw that in Ghana as well. You know, we are surrounded by a, a West African um, region where everybody is in conflict, and we have peacekeepers who have been everywhere around the world, particularly in the army. They've been every, and they keep telling you that they don't want to see Ghana in that way. So there's this narrative about a peaceful Ghana, a peaceful election, that runs, that has been, you know, continuing to run. And that mobilized people to work together when there are difficulties. And we've seen that in the 2008 election, and we've seen that now. So, and I, I think we have to pay more attention to that because in the two, 2012 election, just like Kenya, our, our biometric voter register verification system broke down in 18% of, of, of the, you know, of the uh, polling stations. And yet people were patient. People worked out how they were going to uh, store the ballot boxes after 5 p.m. You know, some went to sleep in the police stations with the ballot boxes. I mean, you know, how do you explain that and, and all of those? So I, I think that we need to look at ideas a little bit more. Now, these ones I'll go quickly over. Just, the just a couple slide. more minutes. Yes. <coughs> and basically, it's thinking about the future. Uh, we, we were asked to look at economic <coughs> transformation, um, how we can manage, uh, you know, electoral conflicts in the future. I just wanted to say that if you look at some of the political economy analysis, whether or not Africa, uh, Ghana will become an African tiger, the, the verdict is not that good. Um, I think the best view for me, which I support, is that we are basically, this is from David Troop, who says we are basically going to muddle through. right? And, and this is because the elections are very competitive. And those competitive elections generate certain types of characteristics you know, for governments. They are short term, they want quick fixes, they want visible projects, you know, they have to look after their foot soldiers, and then these foot soldiers are grassroots you know, party supporters who are uh, out there working for the party so that when the party comes into government and they can control resources, they can do, they distribute it to them. So you cannot think about long term planning. And this is very much the case uh, in Ghana. Um, David Booth, Tony Killick in 205, you know, pointed to the same thing. So, unfortunately, that's the verdict. If you hear from Ghanaian officials or the World Bank about growth, it sounds a little different. That, you know, we are there, we, you know, we, we hit 14.1% uh, growth in, in 2011. And we are, but the character of politics in Ghana does not provide that space. And, and I will sort of agree. Though I think that an emerging middle class and so on, you know, can surprise us. I am not confident now, but they can surprise us. Um, I can, we can talk about how to manage uh, election related <laughs> conflicts, but I wanted to leave you with <coughs> sort of my last thoughts on, on the subject. You know, what lessons and what role can international community play? Yes, we hear a lot of our elections, but I have to say that unfortunately, we cannot take it for granted. Elections are still the game changer in, in, in democracies in transition. They can con completely you know, put, put off all the gains we have made in the last 10 years, 20 years in Ghana, if we don't manage it well. It is still the way in which powerful groups in our society contest for power. And we need to keep uh, you know, paying attention to that. But it's also a double-edged sword. It is producing contradictory effects. 
it le- is providing legitimacy, it's providing stability, but at the same time, it's feeding clientelism, it's feeding corruption. How, d- how do we transition within that process? So those are some of the things. And I think that generally, if you put democracy uh, in the current picture, democracy building in Africa, I think we are in a very tricky place. How do we manage, how, how do countries like, like Ghana, like Kenya, you know, sort of manage stability, look for long-term economic growth within this kind of political contest? And I think these are, you know, it needs a lot of deep thinking and, and, and rethinking. So I wanted to sort of leave those final thoughts uh, with you. Thank you Fantastic. Very much. Thank you very much indeed.